What is courtroom epistemology? It's not my job to make my opponent's case. In fact, if you did, it would be unethical. In science, if you don't give an honest appraisal of risk, and risk is not just bad, risk is what can happen times what are the odds. Risk can be negative. What can happen can be good. So we have to assign probabilities. Therefore, to sit and select out of context bits of information that support your client's interest or your ideology is unethical and a quick trip to a bad reputation with no grants, no promotions, uh, and hard to get your papers published. So now you go out in the advocacy world where everybody spins for the client and for their ideological interest, except the scientists, that's really countercultural in science. So there are a lot of scientists who actually believe that it's scientifically irresponsible to play in this game. <coughs> because if you can't lead with your caveats, you can't give full disclosure that you're not being fair to your requirements as a scientist. And they live in, in what I call the myth of objectivity. We're all objective. And we're not spun by, by ideological preconceptions. Of course, that very few is not objective because it forgets the fact that when scientists put what the economists call type one error, type one error is a false, a, a false positive. Uh, I better not tell them that we have this really serious risk because we don't really have enough good science because then I might be wrong and they'll blame us for it and they might actually act on something that's not important. <clears throat> then there's the other side, the type two error, which is the false negative which is, well, there's uncertainty, let's not say anything. Well, let's use uncertainty as an excuse not to say anything. And then you don't hedge against potentially dangerous outcomes. So whichever you prefer is a personal value judgment and it is not a scientific judgment. And I can promise you, even the IPCC in this very time has significant differences across working groups based upon the type one error version of the physicists and chemists in working group one, versus the type two error version of the social scientists and policy type people in working group two. My chapter in working group two talked about potential sea level rise as four to six meters of sea level rise with medium confidence, which means that we took uncertainties and gave it a label of probability, which in that lexicon means one third to two thirds in centuries to millennia. Working group one said, well, the Greenland ice sheet is melting much faster than any of our models, therefore we don't know anything, so we won't say anything. So their view was type one error version, implicit, unconscious, and they call that good science. And what we said is, how can we ignore a really potentially significant consequence for society, though we fully agreed with them on the facts of the case and what the probabilities were. So we basically gave a risk management judgment, which was ordered by the IPCC plenary for our group, and they did what scientists typically do, which is to say no consensus, no comment. And consensus is not about conclusions. Consensus is about the confidence you have in conclusions. And that, that way you let people make their own value judgments about how risk averse they want to be, which is called policy. I'm sorry to say that that epistemological framing is not widely understood. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to hang up my citizenship at the door of the Senate hearing room because I'm a scientist. I will tell you I have a very severe and difficult argument with very, very good dear colleagues in the IPCC who view that as fundamentally irresponsible. And their view is once a scientist crosses over the lines of policy, those bad guys out there, those advocates, are going to believe that because they spin, you spin. So even if you're giving an honest appraisal of the range of uncertainties, you say, in my risk-averse world, I don't monkey around with 10% chance you know, of threatening the life support system, uh, there are people who just don't do that as responsible. And that will continue to go on. And therefore, it's an absolutely made for prime time way for those people trained in political reporting, you know, get the Democrat, get the Republican, to say, what do you mean this consensus? These scientists are disagreeing without bothering to find out what they're disagreeing about, whether they're disagreeing about, about components of the science, as we did not disagree with working group one about that, about the, uh, about the, uh, the sea level rise. 
You disagreed about what you alert people to based upon whether you had a type 1 type of error. And we were pretty explicit about it, and we actually had a resolution for that in the synthesis when Susan Solomon and I spent a year and a half negotiating it. So we turned the medium confidence of four to six meters sea level rise in centuries into risk of meters of sea level rise in centuries. So we dropped the numbers and she came down to that, and it was all right for the governments. What it took was a long negotiation so that we could communicate what was wrong with the way those reports were done, is that they were done as three disciplinary blocks, which the disciplines happen to correlate with people's philosophies. And if there were more upstream interaction, I think we never would have had that almost framework. And that's what I'm advocating very hard now for the next one. So let me, uh, now low probability risk. Uh, you mean you want to deprive the Chinese and the Indians of a chance for uh, economic development and, and, and poor people by worrying about this problem that may not be real? I can't tell you how many times I hear that one. And what do you really think the probability is of a truly catastrophic outcome? There are five, ten years of sea level rise, super hurricanes, big fires, by the way, we're getting all that stuff, which is the very early edge. And, uh, and I say, I don't know, 10%. 10%, that's all, and you want those kind of draconian actions. And uh, oh, I did a poll, which I love to do with audiences. Uh, how many of you or your families have ever had a serious house fire? Uh, yeah, somewhere around 1%, which is back about the number. How many of you have fire insurance? Bunch of fools. <laughs> <laughs> So what we work on is preponderance of evidence. We do not work on falsification. So it's perfectly set up for those people who want to make claims that the mainstream is wrong because they don't frame it <coughs> as the well-established <coughs> competing explanations uh, and speculative. And the job of science is to move the speculative up you know, toward the well-established. But it's not going to happen in the time frame in which serious consequences can happen. Therefore, it's almost always going to be a risk management judgment. Remember, risk is scientific. What can happen times? What are the odds? What to do about it? Things like that is value judgments. And our worldviews are if the bulk of the problem is created by 20% of the world's rich people, thus, uh, and most of the damage goes to the poorer, hotter places, which created uh, only 20% of the problem, but 80% of the people, maybe we have a special moral obligation to raise the elevation of that problem, or if there are potentially reversibility. So you confess your worldview, and then you, then you go on. Okay. The ice melts in Greenland. It opens up opportunities uh, for uh, exploration. In fact, when we got off the plane, there were people um, who had uh, clearly what was uh, coring devices. So I said, oh, which one of the scientific teams are you going up with? And they said, well, we're actually here without COA. So this is viewed as a major opportunity. Well, it is a major opportunity to bring money in, but if it brings in 20,000 roughnecks who get drunk on Friday and Saturday night, what does that do to indigenous culture when there are only 60,000 people living there who are Inuits in a different culture? And so, in fact, I found out when I started saying that that it was easy to end up spending my time in Greenland TV studios because that was of tremendous interest to people and it's a major, I'm sure you're aware, a major frontline debate. The benefits that are economic, that are positives in a cost-benefit analysis were viewed by many people as a strong negative in terms of what it does to existing culture. There is no right or wrong. That's a value judgment. And the question as to what decision you make has to be a political negotiation that keeps these justice components front in mind. And how do you optimize across multiple metrics that are non-monetizable? You make a political decision. How do we choose what fraction of the US budget should be spent on defense, what fraction on education, what fraction on welfare, what fraction on national parks? Nobody goes and does a cost-benefit analysis. You want to look at costs to make certain that you could do it. That's uh, completely legitimate. But they're not valuing those different things in some form of monetary form. It's the gut check values of the society and the political ideologies of the people. Fine. Once you've selected how much you do, 
Now you bring in the economists with cost effectiveness because it's stupid to waste money, and now you want to sit and you want to compete them to see how you can achieve these goals at the lowest cost. That's an exactly proper role for bringing in economic analysis, not for making the decision in the first place. Now what I'm saying is not considered to be rational by a lot of my friends, and I have many friends who are economists, and I keep asking them, do you value your child more than your grandchild? Because if you discount, you do. And they say, that's not true, because if we spend money now that could be put into the economy, we're leaving them a legacy of wealth and infrastructure for which they're better off. And I said, but you're leaving them a wealth of biotic impoverishment, sea level rise, and disrupted climate. And well, if they're richer, they'll figure out how to fix it. So what it really comes down to is a deep and abiding belief in whether or not we can substitute ecosystem services by using money and human ingenuity.